So what I want to talk about today is a system that I've been developing for the last few years called the home run swing. So that's the catchy name for basically using really good leverage from the options market to swing trade. So basically combining technicals and options for really, really good leverage and defined risk. So it's a really exciting setup that I'm going to go through today. I'm going to talk through just one of the technical setups that I use and how I try to get through to it. And hopefully you guys uh, can learn to take advantage of these kind of opportunities as well. Before I get into that, uh, my lawyers basically tell me to always put this at the beginning of any presentation. So just be aware that all services and content are provided for educational and information purposes only and are not intended as legal or financial advice. Let me leave that up for you guys for a few seconds so that you can make sure you've read it as much as you need here. All right, hopefully that gave you guys all a chance to read through that. Um, so Rene gave, basically gave me an introduction already. I wanted to expand on it a little bit just to make sure you guys understand where I'm coming from and why I think that this setup works and how I kind of developed it, okay? So I started in the SIBO pits, trading on the floor, I traded through the subprime crisis, trading options as a market maker. So people would come in and every time they wanted to buy options, I just told them what price they could buy them from me. And every time they wanted to sell options, I told them what price I would buy them for. Simple as that. And then I used um, hedging strategies to basically try to reduce my overall risks and focus on a volatility trade. Well, as we got through the subprime crisis and markets changed, they tightened up a lot. I mean, you guys probably see it. If you ever look at the options markets, a lot of the markets are only a penny wide. There's not a lot of money to be made if you're trying to buy something and then just make a penny every trade over and over. It just doesn't really generate a lot of revenue. So I started looking for ways to take advantage of either a new market, which is what drove me into trading fixed income options and um, being a portfolio manager for precious metals, trading gold and silver futures options. Uh, a little bit wider markets, a lot more opportunity there during quantitative easing, and then eventually realizing that maybe the best way to go on this now is be the guy that's big. So I we went and worked with a hedge fund after I finished at the University of Chicago, um, focused on commodities. They did a lot of fundamental analy analysis as well as technical analysis. And by combining those two elements, they were generally fairly, fairly successful. And I came in and I helped them structure option strategies, combining their fundamental and technical analysis. So we would sit, they would tell me where they thought soybeans was going, when they thought it was going to get there, and I would structure an options trade that really helped optimize their risk reward profile. Because that's all it is, it's just trying to optimize the risk and the reward. So the market gives you these tools, I want to use them. Recognizing that a lot of this was based upon technicals and seeing a much bigger universe of, of tradable opportunities back in the equity option space, you know, there's thousands of equities out there. I decided to go off on my own, start my company, um, partnered up here with Option Hotline so that we could really develop some interesting uh, products for the retail investors so that we could help retail investors trade smarter, uh, take advantage of the opportunities that the market provides and really not hurt yourself making poor trade choices. So by educating people, hopefully we all can trade smarter. So what I want to discuss today is just one very simple setup. It's a simple swing trading setup. It's a simple technical setup. And then I take that and I'm going to walk you through how I set my price targets. That's risk and reward potential for the trade. Really simple. And then I talk to you guys a little bit about how to use tools, use the nuance of options to make this stuff potentially more profitable why volatility in, in particular matters when I'm doing those trades and how I try to picture volatility when I'm using directional trades and then how I actually incorporate that into structuring a trade. And if you stay through to the end, I'm going to give you my nine step trade checklist that I've got sitting right in front of me right now. I use it every time I enter a trade, I go through this checklist to make sure that I understand exactly what I'm doing and always have my whole trade construction sitting in front of me ready to go. The very first thing that I think everybody needs to make sure that they understand is what a swing trade is. Because you know some of you may know it as a swing trade, technical trade, whatever you want to think of it as. These are short-term trades, okay? So when I think of a swing trade, I think of basically the different market participants that are out there. There's the investor group. 
the guys that are buying a stock and planning to hold it forever, they just believe in the Apple story or the Facebook story, even after a day like today, saying, okay, well, these stocks over the long term are revolutionizing the world. They're going to continue to go higher, and I want to be invested in them. Well, personally, I'm not a very good fundamental analyst. I don't know a lot about why Apple is a better company than Samsung. I don't know why Facebook is better than Twitter. So I focus on the technical analysis because I feel like I can do that better than some of the other analysts out there. I can't do the fundamental, fundamental analysis out there better than other people. The fundamentals are better for the investor group. The technicals are better for the swing trading group. I look for a couple weeks of trades couple weeks long. You know, if I'm in Facebook on the short side, I'm out within two weeks. If I'm in Apple on the long side, I'm probably out within two weeks. I'm just looking for a couple of weeks of movement and then move to the next great idea. You know, I like to tell people that the way I treat the stock market is very different from the way I treat my life. I know my wife better than anybody. I don't know Apple better than anybody. I just know what the chart pattern looks like and the market tends to repeat a lot of these chart patterns. And if I can get a good option volatility setup to go along with it, then that's where I get really excited. Okay. So here's the setup for today. It's a very simple setup. Uh, I'm looking at rectangles. So really what I'm looking for is a stock that hasn't been moving. So everybody's always talking about for options. Oh, you got to find stocks that are moving because that's where you can make a lot of money in the options. I actually look for the opposite. I look for a stock that's had a really well-defined range and isn't going anywhere. And it's a stock that people have not been excited about the options, but it creates an explosive potential move. Because when a stock isn't moving, I think of it like a spring coiling, it's just getting tighter and tighter, and eventually we break out of that range because stocks don't just sit in a tight range forever, most of the time. So what happens here? Let's say we have an example stock here and we'll look at this bullish case as our example because I'm gonna focus on the bullish side, but the same logic can be applied to the bear side. So I have a stock that maybe it's trended up a little bit and it found a seller at $100. So somebody out there says, you know what? I'm willing to sell this stock. I'm gonna take my profits at 100 bucks. So there's a big seller at $100. And so when we get there, people start to recognize that, well, it's probably gonna be tough to get through $100. We call that resistance. Resistance is being formed here. The stock's having a difficult time going higher. So it pulls back to support. And when it hits support, let's say it's $90, there's a new buyer out there. And he's telling you that the price, the stock is undervalued at 90 bucks. And the guy that's selling at 100 thinks it's overvalued at 100. So that generates a new range. This is the technical aspect. Fundamentals aren't expected to be coming in or out during this stuff. No earnings announcements, anything like that. I'm just looking for the stock to trade between a range of 90 and 100. And every time it gets to 100, people are willing to sell. And every time it gets to 90, people are willing to buy. And so it chops. And while it's chopping in that range, I'm watching. I'm not trading yet, I'm watching. Because at some point, if this stock can take out that $100 level and push through, it tells me finally, this stock has run out of sellers. There is a lack of inventory available for sale. The buyers are winning. Somebody got more aggressive, had a lot of stock that he was willing to buy, and he was willing to finally press the price through that upper level. So what? What does that mean to me? Well, now that we know that the imbalance is to the buy side, there's more buyers than sellers in the markets, that helps create further upside. On top of it, it can be more explosive if you've got a long consolidation period because people get complacent when they see a tight range like this going to 100 and down to 90. Every time it gets to 100, they've had success selling the stock for $100. And every time it gets to 90, they've had success buying it for 90. So what do they do? They start trading bigger and bigger size because on top of the fact that it continues to work, they're building equity to their accounts. So they get bigger and bigger on the shorts at 100 and they get bigger and bigger on the long side at 90. Well, then when we finally press through all that offer volume at 100 bucks, We've got two things. We've got that buyer that pressed us through that level. And now we also have all these people that are short the stock, panicking, needing to buy. So if they have to buy, they press the stock higher while a natural buyer is also pressing the stock higher. That creates this launch point that creates really explosive move potential. It's a setup that I'm sure some of you have already seen. I just want to make sure that everybody understands it before we get to the option side of it though, because this is where 
I get a lot of leverage is finding a stock that hasn't been moving and then recognizing the point when it's starting to move. So it's through that resistance point ready to go. And then I start with risk. I say, okay, if I'm trading this on the equity side and I'm long for hundred dollars, right when it broke through that uh, support that resistance level, I'm going to just set my stop loss. It's 90 bucks, the previous support, because if we go through 100 and then actually go through 90, then that tells me that people got too long and wow, now everybody's got to get out. So I'm looking at this saying, okay, well, if this is going to go lower, I don't want to be in it anymore. So I just define my risk. First thing I do is I define that risk. And then I start looking for my profit target. And being mathematically inclined, I was a math major in college. Uh, and then I, was, I did statistics and um, and all that when I was at University of Chicago getting my MBA, I look at stuff in terms of standard deviations. So for those of you that aren't necessarily familiar with the standard deviations, we assume that stocks basically trade within a normal price move of their current price on a day-to-day -day basis and on a week-to-week -week basis and a month-to-month -month basis. And it's, it's kind of a standard bell curve. So a big move is less likely than a small move. And in particular, a one standard deviation move happens less than a third of the time. So a, a move of one standard deviation or more happens less than a third of the time. So if I get a move of one standard deviation in the direction that I'm expecting, that should happen less than a third of the time. But when I see these big potential coils cause a breakout, it happens a lot more frequently. So we get that move a little more likely to occur. So that's what I target. I say, okay, well, if I can get a one standard deviation move over my time frame, let's say it's a month, I want one standard deviation over a month and that's it. That's my initial price target. And I don't necessarily say immediately when I hit that level, I'm out. It's just a level that I have to really refocus my trade and know that I'm closing, closing in on an exit point. The other um, initial exit point that I look, to look for is a big move in a single day. So two standard deviations would be twice the size of the one standard deviation move, but I look at this on a daily chart. If a two standard deviation move occurs, that should only happen once a month. So if I get that in one day, I just had a once in a month return to my stock. I really need to reevaluate whether I want to continue to hold this because maybe that's a sign that there's panic buyers and fear of missing out and all that other stuff. And if that occurs, I got to think about taking profits off of more of like an overbought type scenario. So when people say that there's their stocks overbought, it means that they expect a little bit of a pullback because too many people are piling into the same trade. So that's just it. I mean, I set up a little stop loss, a little profit target, really simple if I'm dealing with this uh, in an equity landscape, because I can set my stop, set my profit target and say, okay, well, if my profit target is a $20 move and my stop is on a $10 move, and I expect 50% chance of hitting my profit target and 50% chance of hitting my stop loss, I should make money because my profit target is twice as long or far away as my stop loss. So that makes it a little bit easier to start running through the R&R on &R an equity trade. Perfect example of it, we'll just look at that chart that I just mentioned. So we we're talking about that stock before, that pretend stock, okay? It's a $90 stock moved up to $100, breaking out of a rectangle, looks like it's got really explosive potential to the upside. And I'm saying to myself, okay, this stock right now over the next month should either reach $120 if that breakout is confirmed and everybody keeps buying, or it'll probably pull back to $90 where I'm gonna get out if it gets below there because that's that prior support. So what am I doing if I have 100 shares of this stock? I'm risking $1,000 to make $2,000. So if I say that there's a 50% chance of hitting my profit target and 50% chance of hitting my stop loss, I expect to make money. It's all about finding something with a positive risk reward profile. And then taking the tools from the marketplace to find out how to get the best risk reward profile. If I think there's only two scenarios that could possibly happen, we either hit 120 or we hit $90, this is easy. I would rather be long call. Now I'll talk to you guys a little bit about the basics of a call option. I know most of you are probably familiar with this. For those of you that aren't though, I wanna make sure you're on, you understand what I'm doing here. A call gives you the right, but not the obligation to purchase the stock 
at the strike price at or before expiration. In this case, I'm looking at the risk reward profile at expiration. So a $100 strike price call gives you the right to buy the stock for $100 when we reach expiration. The expiration in this case would be one month. So in my example, I'm saying an August 26th call, which is not actually a, a true expiration date, but a month from today, if this stock is above $100, I would rather buy the stock for $100 by exercising my call than buy the stock for, let's say it's trading 102. I can make $2 by just exercising my call and selling out the stock for $102. So that's the way the auction works. If that stock, if that call today is priced at $5, then I got leverage here for a move to $120. Why do I have leverage on a move to $120? If the stock goes to 120 by expiration, this call is now worth $20. I can pay $100 for it today, even though the stock is trading $120. So I can make that $20 difference, which means the value of the call has to be $20, the difference between the current, the expiration stock price and the strike price. So if I buy two calls for $5, it's $500 per call because you have a 100 multiplier. That represents 200 shares of stock. So I would be $1,000 of premium. Two times five times 100, $1,000. So I'm putting $1,000 of premium into my call options. And if that stock hits 120, then each of those calls is worth $20. So I have $20 times 100, $2,000, times two calls, $4,000 worth of calls. But remember, I spent $1,000 to start. So I only make 3,000, I make the 4,000 minus the 1,000 I initially spent. That is still better than the stock, okay? So that's the whole thing with auctions is how to get this leverage. I wanna have something that can make money in greater magnitude than the stock if I'm right. But I wanna show you here on one, one important thing is that there's a trade-off every time you trade an option. If this stock is still trading exactly $100 in a month, my call has no value. So I paid $1,000 for two options, trying to get that leverage to the upside, and I lose $1,000. Whereas if I just have the stock position, I break even. So what I'm looking for is these stocks that have this explosive potential to the upside and an unlikely scenario where they're just gonna sit. And sometimes they sit, it happens. But where I get paid is when I get a big move. And I can sleep better at night because if this stock drops from 100 to 60 overnight because the SEC is investigating it or it has bad earnings like Facebook did today, unfortunately, I lose more than my stop. If the stock moves from 100 to 60, I can't get out at 90. I'm gonna lose $40 a share if I'm in stock. So I'm gonna lose $4,000, even though I thought I was risking only 1,000. But in my call position, the worst I can do is lose the premium I paid. So the most I can lose is $1,000. I sleep easier with that. Then on the upside, the alternative could happen. What if the stock gets taken over, runs to $140 overnight? Well, now I'm making a ton of money. My calls are worth $4,000 a piece. That's 8,000 minus my initial $1,000 investment. I make $7,000 instead of $4,000 being in the stock. So I'm getting much better returns. I'm getting one and a half times the return on the upside move to 120 here in exchange for making less money on a small upside move and losing a little bit more on a small downside move. So if I'm looking for a stock that has the chance that it's either gonna go way higher or pull back, I can get leverage in the stock market or in the options market. That's what I want. I want leverage. I wanna make more money, especially when I'm right. Now, a lot of people make a major mistake when trading options, and I just wanna show you guys this right now because if you take away nothing else from my presentation, it's just understand this risk. So if you take away absolutely nothing else, just please, please look at this one slide. If I'm willing to spend $10,000 on stock buying 100 shares for $100, why wouldn't I buy $10,000 worth of calls? It's because of the risk. It has nothing to do with the amount of money I have in my account. When I'm trading options, 
It's about how much money I'm willing to lose, not how much money I have in my account. If I'm only willing to risk $1,000 if this stock goes down to 90 and I spend $10,000 on calls and the stock drops and these calls decay much faster than the stock price and go to zero, I lose $10,000, not 1,000. I lose 10 times what I would have lost being in stock. So that's why I limit the size of this trade to match my, to my risk tolerance for stock, not to match my account size. And I've seen people make this mistake a number of times, and I really hope none of you guys make it after seeing this slide. Because if I lose $10,000 and my account size was say $50,000, I've just now lost 20% of my account instead of the 2% I was willing to risk before. Or if I have a $10,000 account and I risk all of it on there, I just blew out on one trade when I knew that over time my system should have worked, I put all my eggs in one basket. Poker players don't sit there and go all in every time they have a decent hand. They put a few chips in the pot every time and try to build up their equity. And that's what we're trying to do here when we trade. We're building up our equity. We're not going all in every time we get a hand. All right. So I've told you why I use options, but why does volatility matter? Because a lot of people will tell you, okay, well, great. I get options and I use them because I get leverage and defined risk. Why does it matter what volatility is? Well, volatility is the input that market makers and vol traders get to put into their models. So we sit there and we say, okay, I expect this stock to move at a certain rate going forward in the future. That's the parameter I'm looking for, is how much movement do I expect in the future on this stock? If the stock normally moves at a 36% realized volatility, which is roughly 2-ish percent a day, a little more than 2% a day, then when it gets cheap, 30% or expensive, 42%, that changes the price of the options. And when we change the price of the options, we change the risk reward profile of the options. I can't sit there and go into the store and say, I want to buy a shirt and I don't care what the price is. I'm just buying shirts today. If I'm doing my research right and I go to the clearance aisle or the clearance rack and find a shirt I really like, I can buy three shirts instead of one. So that's what I'm trying to do when I get a good implied volatility setup. When implied volatility is low, I'm finding the discount. So if implied volatility is fair, 36%, the normal volatility of this stock, then this calls the $100 strike call. So the call that gives me the right to buy stock for $100 is worth $5. And if vol gets cheap, if people are selling implied volatility, selling options to these market makers, they lower their implied volatility parameter and the volatility gets cheaper and thus the options get cheaper. And so we get a 17% discount on these calls. And if implied volatility gets expensive because people are expecting movement going forward, so they're buying out of the money calls, they're buying out the money calls, they're buying out of the money puts, they're buying out the money puts, whatever they're buying, they're expecting a big move, the volatility goes up, and now they're 16% more expensive than they would have been when they were fair value. This 36% um, is just a random scenario. So don't think of 36% as the average vol for anything, but if I'm looking at this for a specific stock, I will look at the trading range of volatility. Volatility has a bit of a mean reversion characteristic, unlike stocks. Stocks kind of follow random walk and sometimes trend for a while and sometimes go counter trend. And there's all these little, you know, pretty things you can do. Volatility doesn't tend to trend up or trend down. It tends to bounce around and stay in a range. When volatility gets cheap, buyers tend to step in and start buying it and the stock starts to move a little bit more every once in a while. And that creates some of these scenarios. So when volatility gets cheap, it's usually because the stock's been sitting for a while and then it breaks out of the range. So volatility goes up back to its normal level. When volatility gets cheap, the stock's not moving much. People oftentimes walk away from that stock. They stop trading it because it's not moving enough. Well, as you reduce the liquidity, the volatility goes back up and the opposite's true on the upside. When volatility goes up, Sometimes we see some changes to the market landscape that initially create illiquidity, which caused that move. And then more liquidity starts to come in as people get more confident with the ranges that the stock can trade in and that person's volatility right back down. So we get mean reversion in the volatility landscape. Where I get my leverage is not by buying it in the money call. 
Because when I see this in the money call, I can say, okay, well, if volatility is cheap, I'm getting it at a discount, 8% off, that's pretty good. When I get a stock that's about to explode to the upside based upon a technical breakout and has volatility cheap, I look at these out of the money calls. Let's look at the 106 calls, for example. If volatility was fair, it's worth a little under $3. If volatility is expensive, it's three and a half. If volatility is cheap, it's under $2. So I'm getting this on the clearance rack. I think of this as basically there's a little bit of an edge to buying it with cheap vol. These are on sale, these are on clearance. I, when I see this move, I'm expecting realized vol not to be the fair value, but to be that high value because we've created an illiquidity scenario. So instead of being able to buy what I think should be fair value at three and a half dollars, and getting to buy three of those calls for $1,000, I get to buy five for $2. This is the clearance. I get to buy three and get two for free. That's a better deal for me. That's where I get my leverage. By going into the options market, I've defined my risk. By doing my volatility analysis, I get my leverage. Let's look at it. For those of you that look at things a little more visually, this is about the best I can do for giving you a picture of how much more money I can make when volatility is cheap versus when it's expensive. So on the left, if I buy $1,000 worth of calls when volatility is cheap, so you buy like one and a quarter of these calls, two and a quarter of these calls, or five of these calls, instead of a little over one, less than two, and almost three, I get a lot of leverage. I still have the same defined risk. I don't change my risk at all. I am looking for options that are on sale when they shouldn't be on sale. And then I say, okay, I'm still going to spend $1,000 today. My shopping spree is for $1,000. And I'm not going to just buy whatever's on sale because it's on sale. I'm buying what's on sale because I want it. So I go in, I find what's on sale. I find that leverage. I pull out $1,000 and I can either buy couple, almost a little over one of the 94 calls in this you know, sort of calculation or five of these 106 calls. And if this stock hits my price target of $120, I make $6,000 on $1,000 of risk. That is the home run I'm looking for. If volatility is high, I go in and I say, I absolutely need to buy shirts today and I don't care what the price is. Oh, everything's expensive. Okay, I only get to buy three of these 106 calls. I only make $3,000. Yes, it's better than stock if I get to $120, but it's much worse than stock until I get above $115. So if I was right that this stock was gonna go up and it rallies to 109, sure, I almost made money. Because remember, I paid three and a half initially. So I have a 9% rally in this stock. It got about halfway to my price target, just under halfway to my price target, and I lost money. That is about the most frustrating scenario for the directional options trader. It happens. That's my trade-off for this kind of payoff. And that's why I want to get that break-even point as close to where we are right now, and I get that when implied volatility is cheap. I get it when I can buy things on clearance. If I buy the in-the-money option instead, it increases the probability of being right i.e. making money, because my break even on this $94 call relative to stock is around $106. And if we go all the way up to 120, I make more than I make by buying stock. So the real benefit of that in the money call is simply the defined risk. The, uh-oh, what if we drop to 60 bucks overnight scenario? It doesn't really do much better than the stock in general, if I'm defining my risk the same way. When volatility is high, I don't even get any benefit out of that $94 call. That's $6 in the money call. It's all about the risk definition. The out of the money call is where I get my leverage. With the trade-off of if this stock only goes up a little bit, it doesn't work for me. But that's why this is the home run swing and not the uh, bunt single. I'm looking for that big potential payoff. All right, so this is the key for me. Finding low implied volatility at a time when the stock should move. It's, it's got that lottery characteristic, but I've increased my probability of the way that I try to structure these. And that's exactly what I'm talking about right here, is how, to, how do I structure these trades?
all right? What do I do? I look for a setup with low implied vol volatility relative to history. So I talked about that 36% normal volatility stock and okay, cool, it's trading at 30% implied volatility and it rarely trades below there. So it's really cheap relative to its historical mean, its historical average. Because again, I expect implied volatility to have mean reverting characteristics. And again, I'm at the clearance rack and I found the thing that I want. I'm not just buying everything that's on the clearance rack just because it's on the clearance rack. I found a technical setup I like and it's cheap. And guess what? The reason I love rectangles is because oftentimes that low realized movement pushes implied volatility down. If the stock has gone between 90 and 100, back to 90, back to 100, back to 90 and back to 100, the guy that's long options like the 105s or those 106s I talked about is getting really frustrated because you never get anywhere close to being in the money on them. And so all of his options, every time he buys options, they end up expiring worthless and nothing is going his way. And people start recognizing that, gosh, we never go below 90. So every time we get to 90, I'm just going to sell a put. And every time we get to 100, I'm going to sell a call. And look how much money I'm making because I'm always right. We never go above 100. We no, never go below 90. And that naturally forces volatility down. On top of it, realized volatility has probably been low. And people are just trading the range using the options now on top of using the stock. That increases the coil because a guy that sits there and set, keeps selling out of the money calls every time we get to $100, all of a sudden he is also scrambling if the stock goes through. Let's think of a scenario here. The guy that's in those 106 calls, he keeps selling them at two bucks to me and a dollar and a half to other people. And he's just selling them at whatever price he can get because it's never going to come in the money because we always stop at 100. Well, he wakes up in the morning and we're trading 104 and those calls are worth three and a half. He's starting to get a little nervous. Those calls he sold for two have appreciated by 75% overnight on a, just a $4 move. And there's no obvious stopping point for the stock anymore. All those guys that have been selling stock, they're covering their position. And he's now scrambling to cover his calls. When you call buy calls, the guy that's on the floor, that market maker, he sells you those calls, but then he has to buy stock to cover his position, reduce his delta risk, reduce his upside risk. That's how he hedges. That puts the stock even more, gives him even more momentum to the upside. That's what generates this explosive move. It's going off the springboard and we go higher. And it gets really exciting for me because if I can find a rectangle with low implied volatility, it means there are people out there that are short options and they may have to scramble too. And the point of the market, when you get one of these sort of scenarios, a breakout where the short squeeze happens and the short call guy is getting squeezed is basically to inflict maximum pain on the guy that's wrong. The guy that was wrong today in Facebook was long or short puts. They, they, they inflicted maximum pain on those guys. And then I simply structure my trade. So what I do to structure my trade is to try to make sure that I'm gonna make money as long as I get a standard deviation move. But one standard deviation move, I need to make money. So I start around a month expiration, often less, because the way that options work, I like to have a little bit less time to expiration because those can appreciate in value more quickly. And I start with a 30 delta option. So for those of you that are familiar with options, 30 delta, is gonna be a little bit out of the money on the call side. And you can think of 30 delta, the delta of an option, as roughly the probability that it will finish in the money. It's a rough proxy for that. So this option would traditionally have about a 30% chance of finishing in the money, all else being equal. But I find that when I do this trade, it ends up in the money far more often than that because of that squeeze potential. So that's where I get my leverage. If I go too far out of the money, too far up, so let's say it's a $100 call and I go to the 115 calls, sure, I might be able to buy those really cheap and have a huge return if we get to $120, but I really, really hate losing money on a stock that goes from 100 to 114 because I structured it for a move to 120. I got 70% of the move I was expecting and lost money, that hurts. So the 106 call, the one I generated before in that example, that's more like the R&R that I'm looking for. It 
you know, I get 60% of my move and I'm still going to make money. I get 50% of my move. I'm still going to make money because the market, I don't know where it's going to stop. It might stop at 110, might stop at 115, might stop at 120. It might keep going. I wait for other technical signals to tell me when that's over. But initially I want to get a standard deviation move. And that's it. It's pretty simple for that, for the entry. There's more to a trade than the entry, of course. And I'm going to go to the, through some examples, but first I'm going to give you my checklist. I promised it at the beginning. I want you guys to have my trading checklist. You can go to optionhotline.com slash Keith's checklist, and you can download it for free just because you decided to come here today. So I'll put out the, the link there in the chat, go there, put in your email. I'll email you my trading checklist that I've got sitting right in front of me and I use it for the trades that I put on here, okay? So optionhotline.com slash Keith's checklist for your free checklist. Now I have three examples I wanted to get through for you guys just to show you how this trade actually works. These are all trades that have happened in about the last month and a half. So they're all recent. You can see really how these work in action. So Monster Beverage, had been trading in a tight range roughly from the beginning of June until June 25th. So a little under a month of tight range trading between around $55 and 57.30, which was the June 25th high right there. And then on June 29th, four days later, the stock went through that level. So we made a new high. This move looks like it's got some potential for a bigger move. So I only had to get four, or, you know, three or four weeks of, of consolidation here to generate that potential upside, especially because volatility was relatively cheap here. So yeah, we did have a dip down here on June 15th to about 21%. And you can see here the red line is implied volatility and the blue line is realized volatility. I want you to focus on the red line here because this is the thing that I think mean reverts. So you can see here that the range has been from about 21 to 38. This happens when it's coming up on earnings because people expect a big movement on er move on earnings. So when there's no earnings coming up, I'm expecting this to be about a 26, 27, 28 ball stock. This is sort of the analysis that I do on when I look at these stocks. So it's still cheap. So I look at the options surface and I go out to July 20th calls, $59 strike. They're $1.70 out of the money and they're 55 cents. If I get a big move in three weeks, I'm certainly expecting these to be in the money. And what happened? They went well in the money. So we had the breakout, it just kept going. And on June, sorry, July 17th, just under three weeks from my entry, MNST was up to $62.17. I exited my calls for $2.74. So that's just under 400% return in under three weeks on these out of the money calls when the stock was up eight and a half percent. Endosite is another example of this. It's a biotechnical company. It's not the most liquid in the world. They've been trading in a range after a couple of breakouts. So you can see there's a rectangle here that it broke out of, and then we generated a new trading range. And it looked like we were breaking out on May, uh, on June 11th, I apologize, from this May 17th high. It was generated right there. So it looks to me like, okay, great. This stock has a lot of potential to go higher. 1486 was the high. We're above it. And implied volatility was pretty near the lows here. So it upticked a little bit on the next day, but generally speaking, this is a stock that you can get 90, 100, and you can even see back here 110, 120%, because when, when these illiquid biotechs start to move, they often get really crazy. So I bought July 20th, $17 calls for 60 cents. Fit my parameters pretty well. And what happened? The breakout didn't really confirm and we never really hit my stop. So you see it never broke through that support level and didn't really go above my resistance level again, that initial breakout level for about three weeks. And then finally it went and got through my strike finally in the last week of expiration. And I exited my calls a little bit earlier than the close. So I got lucky, you know, not lucky, but I, you know, I tried to use a little bit of an opportunity here to, to take some money and I got out of these calls for 45 cents. So even though this stock was up almost 17%, I lost 25%. This is exactly what I talked about being a little bit frustrating when we try to, when I try to play these moves, but it's the trade-off I take in order to have that potential return. Like I saw on MNST or GoPro. So GoPro is another interesting stock on June 4th. 
you can see how this box was starting to form. The rectangle was forming. There's a smaller rectangle right here, oops, and a bigger rectangle going up to here where the high is on May 17th and 18th at $6.02. So when we first got through the May 31st high of 568 and a name that I thought had a chance for a short squeeze from a different perspective, I looked at this as saying, well, this is an initial breakout. There's a decent chance we get to six bucks and probably higher. So I bought the June 22nd six calls for 12 cents. These were at the lowest ball you've ever seen GoPro. What happened? Three days in, we broke through 602, pulled back. This was my new support level and then ran. So I got out of this on June 12th for when the stock was about six and a half dollars for 51 cents. It's 325% in only eight days. That is the kind of setup I'm always looking for on this, these kind of moves. Now, finally, I just want to let you guys know that I do this all day, every day. So I'm sitting there sifting through the clearance racks, trying to find which options are mispriced given that potential for a technical move. Uh, I manage a trading program called the Home Run Swing Trader. If you want to find out more about that, go to go.optionhotline.com slash home run. I'll give you that link in chat as well. Oops. Sorry about that. Switch the, there we go. We switched the screen there. So I'm gonna give you that link real quick. And then I'll take a couple more questions as we have time here. Let's get you to the end there so you can see the link on the, there we go. So go.optionhotline.com slash home run. And then I'll take a couple of questions here as we're running low on time. I see a couple in here. Um, do I avoid earnings? I generally avoid earnings. And the reason that I avoid earnings is because volatility is usually not cheap going into earnings. So everybody knows that when Facebook announces earnings, the stock's going to move. When Amazon announces earnings, the stock's probably going to move. So they bid up the options. That implied volatility parameter goes higher. It becomes really hard to get things on clearance when everybody knows it's time to be long options. Find that protection and find that leverage. Run-ups to earnings can sometimes be played. Uh, but I have to, I tend to use options that expire before that earnings event because that's where that option can be a little bit cheaper. So if a stock's been consolidating, heading into earnings, and I've got some time still to earnings, if this is something that, you know, earnings is a week away, I'm going to have a tough time finding big leverage for a fast move. Um, and then there's a question on the checklist. If you go to the link, you, you type your email address in there and click, and that'll send you your checklist in your email. And I'm always, well, in this setup, yes. There's a question of if I'm always buying out of the money options. And yes, with this setup, I'm buying out of the money options because I'm getting that leverage from cheap volatility when a stock is looking to explode. So I think that there's an explosive move potential. I want those out of the money options for that big leverage return. If there are any more questions, I'd be happy to take them now. And as a reminder, guys, you know, the optionhotline.com home run slash home run here, that's for the home run swing trading program. Uh, I talk through ideas that I'm finding if, with this setup and many others that give a lot of leverage for swing trades. Uh, and then no matter what, you should go to optionhotline.com slash Keith's checklist to get my trading checklist for free. Then you actually have the checklist that I've worked on developing over my 13 plus years of trading to generate and manage my trades. Uh, there's a question of if this works with Forex. Um, so what I have often found, it's not always the case, but some, but oftentimes when you get these bigger macro products, Forex and things like that, then it does not, um, it doesn't always work because there's so many more participants in there. Let me see, I'm being told that the checklist link doesn't work. Try this one more time. Did I give you a typo in there? It should work unless I put a typo in there. Okay, so for the checklist, go to optionhotline.com slash Keith's checklist. I just tried it on my screen here. So type that in, make sure that, that, that you hit optionhotline.com slash Keith's checklist and see if that works for you. And please let me know if it doesn't work. If that does not work for you, you can email me and I will forward you a fresh link. 
keith at tradeacademy.co. That's right here. I'm putting it up in front of you on the notepad there. Keith at tradeacademy.co. Can somebody else please test that uh, option hotline? Uh, removing the forward slash from the end of the link and it worked for you. Okay, so there you go. We'll, we'll try it one more time here without the forward slash at the end. For some reason that is breaking the link for people. So I clicked on it right here. It's creating a problem because there's a space in there, I think. There it is. It's that space. Somehow it got a space at the end of it. My apologies for that, guys. And if you click enter on that, that should bring you right to. There we go. Yep, removing that that slash at the back. It'll get you to the checklist there. And you just enter your email and hit get access now, and you'll get that now. All right, sorry guys about the slash. For some reason, I'm not sure why that didn't work for you, but now it should. <laughs>